a lot of people have been asking, how do I adopt a horse? Uh, should I adopt a wild horse? What do you recommend? How do I do it? How do I start? And whether it's through the Bureau of Land Management Adoption Program or through a sanctuary or rescue, we wanted to offer you know, whatever support that we could. So we're going to try to address some of your questions today. We're going to start with just showing you two little clips from two of our adopters. Then we'll tell a story about an unsuccessful adoption that was then remedied. And then we're going to get into some of the content for the webinar. And we have Celeste Carlisle on the line, too. She's going to be helping out with some of the facts from how to adopt from the BLM and the BLM's adoption program. She's on the Wild Horse and Brew Advisory Board and sits on the committee to expand adoptions and to improve that program. So that'll be exciting to hear more details from her in a little while. So enjoy the two videos and thank you. Hi, I'm Karen Svian and I've always had a heart for the wild horses and have been following Return to Freedom for the last few years on what's been happening in the plight of the wild horse. So when an opportunity came up to go and do a sanctuary photo tour, I jumped on it. It was fabulous. And then it just kept getting better. And it, in the end, I ended up coming back four times. Ultimately, I'm bringing back to Texas with me is a mare, a doe, a roan out of the heart herd. I wanted to get off on a good start. I did a Carolyn Resnick clinic, trained with Angie and Seth Murray who have a lot of experience with wild horses because it's a little different from domestic. Do dare to dream because they come true. She'd always say, this would be a great horse for your husband. We drove off and I said, I, I have to get this horse. We fell in love with snow, and then we got to go over there and kind of see the whole mm -hmm. operation the organization. and meet Netta, and that was real special, and fill out the paperwork. We owe everything to snow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, everything. snow. Snow is the beginning of our story. He's, he, this horse has been my, you know, re, rebirth. And the funny thing is, I had to have a heart mount because I'm always asking my husband, hey, can I ride your horse? When she came to me, she was just a little tiny thing. She warmed my heart immediately. Yeah. Horses' eyes and just see so much of not only his life, but yes. the lives of his family and, and where he's been and his herd. People who have Mustangs, we all kind of do a nod to each other and we kind of look at each other and go, yeah, we figured this one out. Sutter was a, a, an amazing stallion. He actually has been an ambassador for Return to Freedom since 2002. But back in 1987, he was adopted in the BLM program back then. And he was adopted as a young colt. He was about two years old, adopted by someone who had a lot of skills. They were a professional roper. They knew uh, how to ride. They were... Um, had a lot of experience with horses, but they adopted this young colt, and unfortunately, they came from the point of view that to break his spirit, they would have to do things like hog tie his legs and lay him under a hot tarp in the sun, uh, withdraw food and water, and that kind of abuse. So Sutter suffered a lot of abuse simply because of the misunderstanding about stallions, even though he was a young colt, and the misunderstanding about mustangs. So some of what I wanted to talk about today was what is a Mustang and defining our perception and our expectations and then talk about the horses and what, where they came from and their herd communities. Sutter did suffer and then was returned to the Bureau of Land Management at an adoption, a public adoption, where luckily a friend of mine was there and saw him literally be thrown out of the trailer and returned where he was then put into a pen with other stallions and continued to be beaten up by these older stallions. So she got it over time, you know, trust was, was won and it took time, it was patience and caring and all the stuff that we would want if we were him, but it really, he was really traumatized. And when I see something like that and I hear a story like that, or if I perceive people that are treating horses in a way 
that will exacerbate this kind of problem or create this kind of behavior, I, it's sad because it's not necessary. It's not necessary at all. If we could all just take one minute and say, what is a Mustang? Just ask ourselves, what is a Mustang? Is it a breed? Um, what does wild mean to you? What does it mean to be wild? Those are important questions because we have people come here. We have hundreds, if not thousands, of people that come through every year. And often this idea that a Mustang is a breed, and it's not a breed. Usually Mustangs are made up of a variety of breeds of horses that were captured from an area in, in which historically they ended up either through a ranch, ranching community, uh, cavalry remount stock, draft horses that were helping to create the ranchos in that area, uh, or any number of reasons, horses that were remnants from the, S the Spanish explorers that had interbred with ranch horses later after the 1800s. Some of them are, have more Spanish barb tendencies, otherwise maybe more draft and larger breeds that came over from Europe later. But in any case, they're a mixture of breeds. So when we talk about a Mustang, it's really a derivative of the word Mustaño. From Spanish, it means a horse that has no home. And so we're looking at a horse that has been born free on the range, being raised in a herd community. They understand herd etiquette. They understand what their role is in their band and what their band's role is in the larger herd community on that range. And there's a lot of behaviors. We just want to broaden our conversation to when we're talking about adoption, it's critical that we understand what these horses have left, what they've lost, what they've been ripped away from. And then how do we create value for ourselves to them? So what do we have to give them to replace you know, what they've lost. If it's a young horse, you're really looking at how to create that education that they need. And if it's an older horse, they've really lost everything. They've lost their relationships. Think about what you have to, to offer a horse. How do we build value? And we're going to talk more about that later when we're introducing ourselves into the horse this world, basically, when they arrive at your doorstep. But I think right now I'm going to turn this over to Celeste, who's going to talk a little bit about adoption as a management tool. So hi, everybody. This is Celeste Carlisle. I'm the biologist with Return to Freedom. In the early 70s, when the Bureau of Land Management was first handed over the management of our wild horses on public land, part of the strategy for maintaining an appropriate management level, which that's that's a whole other webinar, um, but was to gather and remove horses from the range if they were above what was considered an acceptable level of horses on that range, and then to put them into an adoption program. And in the beginning, the idea was that those numbers that were gathered from the range were going to equal the number of horses that were going to be adopted. So, you know, the idea was sound. However, as we look at these numbers, that worked pretty well early on, but as numbers continued to expand on the range and the numbers of horses that could be adopted didn't actually meet the number that were being removed from the range, then what happened is that horses needed to be basically warehoused. And so we can see in these recent numbers here below that we're gathering way more off the range today than we are able to adopt. In fact, last year, you can see 2,900 horses were adopted in 612 burrows. Those remaining horses are ending up in first short and then long-term holding trials. So what we wanted to say about adoption as a management tool is that it is just a small, small portion of what should be layered management on our ranges. And one thing that Return to Freedom is hoping and wanting to do is be helpful in some of that adoption process, but again, it, it's not like that's the entire solution or that we or any one group would be making a huge difference, but we certainly do want to make sure that horses that are going into adoptive homes are well-matched and successful, which we're going to be getting back into a little more in a little bit. And this chart here 
is showing Wild and Horses and Burroughs sold, I think, um, as part of the, um, not part of the typical adoption program, but as part of the horses that have are 10 years of age or older or have been offered more than three times for adoption, then they can go into full sale authority, which means they can sort of end up wherever. And that's not a huge number of horses in the past couple of years, but if, it is, of course, of concern to folks where those horses are ending up. The nut of this story is that adoption is not the management tool solution that it was sort of envisioned to be in the beginning, but it is a small portion of what needs to happen. And those of us in the horse world that can provide those good homes and those resources to help place horses are desperately needed. The other thing is that if, if someone is gonna adopt a horse from, from the BLM, for example, um, it's not necessarily so that that horse is trained to any level. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that further down in the slides, but you can see that in these past years from 2012 to 2017, but as you can see from those numbers, it's not like a heck of a lot of horses are getting adopted. I think we're up to about 4,000 a year getting adopted just through Bureau of Land Management efforts, and of course that needs to be much higher. Our position on adoption, which I'm going to have Netta fill in on a little bit, it's part of a solution. It is not the solution, but it is important that these horses find good homes, if at all possible. Netta, did you want to add to that about Return to Freedom's position? When Return to Freedom originated, as the founder, I'm pretty much a purist. I'm not a big proponent for adoption. I'm not a big proponent of the adoption program. However, the reality is that the horses are coming off and those that come off are not going back out. And the young horses, the adoption program will continue to exist. So my feeling is that the people that can provide a good home for a horse, whether it's a wild horse or a domestic horse, um, but in this case, let's stick to the horses that are coming off the range, wild horses that are used to being living in herds. I recognize that that is going to continue to happen. It's going to be a component of the BLM's program. And so we feel that it is our responsibility to do our part to support adopters and the horses so that they have a successful transition into the domestic world and a safe transition and that it becomes a really positive experience for both the horse and the human. So that's our position. At our core, we hope that there's a day that wild horses will be managed on the range and that they can continue to live out their lives on the range. Those of you who know us, we, you know, apply the PZP fertility control vaccine and have done so since 2000. But the horses that are coming off, we are hoping that we can support more and more people. The horses that were born at Return to Freedom Sanctuary because the PZP vaccine does not affect all mares. So we do have a couple of, we usually have about six or so a year that were born over the years. We have a higher efficacy rate at the moment <laughs> and continue to allow our horses at the sanctuary to live in bands so that we can become available for a lot of these horses that are coming off the range to avoid them becoming three strike horses and being vulnerable to sale authority, which is sale without restriction or abuse and preventing them from ending up in auctions and going to slaughter. So we work on, advo on the advocacy level as well for all of that to help change policy. But we are working with people. We have a mentorship program that we'll get into later so that we can help people transition and the horses to transition into a more domesticated lifestyle that can be nourishing for the horse and the human. We want to try to open up the dialogue to people that have experience with horses, but maybe haven't taken the step into adopting a Mustang for whatever reason, various considerations. So one of the things that I want to address is having the understanding of what the horse's experience has been so far. These horses are born in vast open spaces with a very diverse terrain generally, with harsh conditions and varied temperatures. It can be very, it, usually the high, high desert. It can be cold at night and in the morning it can be very hot in the day. They often have to travel far for water, especially later in the year towards the end of the summer, into the fall. So they're heading into 
winter and depleted conditions. But over the last few hundred years, these horses have adapted and become ex extremely hardy. And through natural selection, all in all, you end up with pretty strong, uh, sturdy horse with keen instincts and highly sensitive. And therefore, when they're born out there, the mayors in the herd are shaping the character of these horses from the minute they're born. They are getting their education not only from their mother, but they're getting it from all the matriarchs in the band. They're learning from the stallions. The stallions have a significant role. We've done webinars on stallion behavior. And they're being prepared for them to leave their band and to go and join another band or start their own band or join a bachelor band if they're cults in the future. There is a community that's existing in the natural world, on the range, that these horses are born into. And every minute of every day, they are having an education that their survival depends on. And their role within the herd is clear to them, whether they're a, a dominant horse or not a dominant horse, they understand the signals and the cues from the other horses in the herd. And if they don't, they're usually the, those are usually the horses that you'll see the pretty beat up, the younger horses that might have a lot of nips and kicks on them because they're <laughs> not reading the signals from their herd mates. And you'll see that in your own corrals as well often. So we want to understand that when we take that education away, so we have to replace that somehow, especially for the younger horses that people are often adopting. People who feel safer adopting younger horses, and some of them might be two years old, so they've had a really good start. For me, personally, working with a two- to four-year-old horse is about where I like to start. They've gotten a lot of education from the herd. At the sanctuary, we don't even think about moving horses out of the herds and the hills until they've been naturally sort of pushed out a little bit and they're wandering, uh, their, their curiosity has taken them into um, other bands or they are exploring people, humans, and we get our hands on them while they're out, at, out in the hills, in, within their herds. So when we transition them into a more domesticated area where we're gonna work with them, they're coming in with their peers, if you will, and it's not a trauma and they've already had exposure to humans and socialization to humans. Um, that is the luxury we have at the sanctuary. The horses that you meet at the corrals, you know, have usually gone through very traumatic experience. They've been chased by helicopters. They've been ripped apart from their um, mothers and their fathers and their friends, and they're, they're pretty shocked and they're scared. There's a lot of fear. Some of them start tuning out. So what we want to do is think about how can we develop an experience for them when we adopt them, but we're replacing their education, giving them a nourishment, and we're giving them a role. We like to establish ourselves in a leadership role because one thing they all look for is leadership. And if you don't provide it, they will take over. And that cannot be a pleasurable experience for a horse or a human down the road. So what we want to do is just to work with trainers or if you have the experience, but to start thinking about how can I replace the relationships that they've just lost. Basic needs for all horses, they need other equine companions. They're highly social mammals, they're highly intelligent, they're very instinctual, and their instincts are keen. It's very important to keep them with other horses. The 20 hours of the day that you're not there, their life continues. So we want to stress that it's important to create an environment that is equine friendly. Horses need shelter. If you're in California, mainly for shade, but wind as well. If you have natural ravines and valleys, uh, natural shelters, that's fine too. Horses do need some form of shelter and a way to get away from the weather. If it's exceptionally wet, it would be good to make sure that you can provide dry ground. If you're going to provide more of a pasture environment, what we have found to be extremely valuable is to have an environment that has a diversity of ground cover. So in terms of sand, rock, that helps to keep their hooves trimmed, it's really helpful. Uh, if they're domesticated, of course, you're going to be trimming them. When they're walking on rock, it really helps stimulate the hoof growth 
and creates a, a stronger hoof as well. And that continues for every generation. They need access to clean, fresh water at all times. Feed and nutrition in general, when we first get our horses, when we've gotten them right off of, from Roundups, what we've done in the past that has always served us well is we provide a variety of grass haze and grass mix alfalfa and grass and oat haze. We provide a variety of quality haze and we set them out and we allow the horses to free feed while they're de-stressing. So they can walk around and just continually graze from quality feed. So if you have a corral, it depends on what size it is. Some people hang feeder bags in different locations to keep the horses moving so they're not just standing in one spot all day long waiting for the next meal, but that they're moving around their area and they're able to graze in different, on different feeds, preferably hay sources. We introduce alfalfa and other kinds of supplements, sometimes for horses that really are undernourished, maybe lactating mares or senior horses. But generally we find, especially with burrows, you don't want to introduce a lot of the sugar, sweet feeds, high protein feeds, unless they need it. But we try, the importance there is to make sure they're moving. So as long as you can keep them moving, they're going to, they'll have a better chance of not foundering or, or creating too much inflammation in the body. It's emulating more what they do in a natural environment where they're seeking out food and they have to roam. They have to move from water to food and from food to food. Activity is important to keep them playing with each other. Activity-driven movement is important for their well-being, for their muscles, for their hooves, and for their minds and their well-being. Freedom to move, freedom so they can run, roll, move, play, interact with each other, mutual grooming. All that is, those are addressing the basic needs to provide a environment for the horse. What level of experience does an adopter need to have, especially recently? We have a lot of people that want to help. They're driven by emotion to respond to the emergencies that never seem to stop. Currently, we're all responding to the Devil's Garden Roundup. We have a lot of people, they're amazing. We get calls all the time. I have 20 acres, I have two acres, I have five acres, but they don't have any experience. It's a challenge because we don't want to encourage people who have zero experience to take a mature wild horse out of that's just been through a roundup and put them on a couple of acres in their backyard or down the road and have them get loose. When a horse first leaves what they know, they're put into a trailer and they're going to travel to your home, to your ranch. When they're unloaded, what you really need to have is a safe environment, including safe fencing. After that, what do you do? So you've, you've got your fencing up, you've got your six-foot panels, you have some paddocks, you have a shelter, you've got hay ready, but you have no experience. But you really want to do this. Maybe you have some experience. Maybe you've ridden horses. Maybe you've even owned horses, but they've always been domestic. One of the things that's important is to... Don't try to be everything right away. Find someone that has a lot of experience working with a horse that has recently been captured, removed from everything he or she knows, put into a variety of trailers and transportation vehicles, pushed through hydraulic squeeze chutes, basically traumatized, and then put into a trailer, traveled to your place, and been unloaded. <laughs> so... We want to make sure that you're really thinking this through because there are trained horses available, whether through sanctuaries or rescues or through the BLM. They have horses that have already been through a training program and have basic training handling on them. If you do want to help horses that have not been handled yet and you have the right environment and you have the resources to work with a trainer who is using a method that is what we want to call natural horsemanship isn't always natural horsemanship. So, but for just for lack of a better word, I'm going to call it natural horsemanship. Here's how I choose a trainer. If it's like watching paint dry, I like them. I'm sitting there and the paint is drying and it's, you know, it looks like nothing's happening, but suddenly a few days later, that horse, his ears are forward, He's relaxed. 
his back is intense, his head's lower, he's comfortable with the person moving in and out of his space, that's the trainer that I'm going to choose for my horse. If you're going to train the horse yourself and you want to you know, obviously you would be somebody that would have a lot of experience. If you don't have a lot of experience, I would definitely recommend working with a trainer, whether it's a wild horse or a domestic horse. I think starting a horse, if you take a two-year-old horse that's been captured uh, on the range, he's not going to be a lot different from a two-year-old horse that grew up on a Wyoming ranch and came in with the herd and was then sold. That's not the issue. You want to make sure that you know how to train a horse from the beginning to the end so that it's safe for you and the horse. As the horses get older, they're stronger, they're bigger, their instincts are more ingrained in them. On the positive side, I'm going to just say from my experience, I would rather work with a horse that has grown up with a herd education than a domesticated horse that has been overly desensitized from birth any day of the week. They naturally understand space and boundaries. And if you understand the body language and that how they respond to movement and how they respond to your movement, where to place yourself so that you are communicating what you want to communicate and that you're clear and consistent, that is going to buy you quite a strong bond and relationship in the long run. And so that is why I prefer working with horses, whether it's horses that were raised on a herd on the range or horses that were at the sanctuary or elsewhere on a ranch that were able to be educated by other horses. To me, it's a safer horse. Horses that are over desensitized tend to be pushier, tend to crowd often. <laughs> you don't get that when you're, when you're working with a horse that's um, more respectful of space. In the beginning, that translates as their concern. They're fearful. They're concerned. This is not a webinar on training. This is just things for you to think about to put on your checklist as you're going down. We have certain people that we work with and we love their program. There are other good people out there I'm sure that we don't know about or that we've heard about and we're happy to introduce you to trainers. If you email us, we can respond to you and we can recommend a whole host of trainers. If you want to adopt an already trained horse through a sanctuary or a rescue, there's any number of organizations that can provide horses that need a good home directly to you. Off the top of my head, I'm going to just go out on a limb here and say Return to Freedom is one. We have Lifesavers, Wild Horse Rescue, Sweet Bow Horses is doing a wonderful job. They've just started out and they're focused on young stallions that have been gilded to get them ready to go into the domestic world. And they're doing a wonderful job as well. And I'm sure there's more out there that I'm forgetting right now, but I just wanted to let you know that some of these horses will be ready for you to go to the next step. They're already, already going to be horses that are happy. They're content. They're, they're comfortable being worked with and being around humans. You can catch them. You can put a halter on them. You can lead them. You can wash them. You can load them in a trailer. You can safely address their hoof care, and you can safely address any vet needs that may come up and build on that. When wild horses first arrive to the sanctuary, we have them in quarantine. For about a month, at least one month, so that if they've contracted pigeon fever or strangles or it has time to show itself and you can see symptoms, hopefully, and address it before they're integrated into a larger herd anything else. They're all together and they get a chance to decompress, get used to being fed, and still stay with their friends. We then move them to an area like this with a large stall area where we can easily separate them for handling to start introducing ourselves. And they have turnout in an alley, which brings them to a larger turnout area or to the back barn area where we have our hydraulic squeeze chute in the event that we do have to handle them for medical reasons or to get their feet trimmed while they're still unhandleable. That way, the horses are never isolated in the sense that they're always with equine companions through quarantine and through the handling, training, educational experience. Taking the time to create a value for that horse to want to connect with you. How do you do that? We want to make sure that people are always building on the yes factor, and that is a very important part of this. From the minute that a horse gets off the trailer onto your property, you know, you want to create an environment 
that's positive. Try to let the horse always win so that they can settle in, they can feel comfortable, and then develop their confidence, their desire to bond with us, to connect with us. Pretend you're 10 years old and you're all alone and there's nobody around to ask and you love this horse and you have to figure out how to win this horse over. You would figure it out. A 10-year-old girl would figure this out. <laughs> Many of us were those 5- and 10-year-old girls. <laughs> and, um, you know, to figure out how to be friends with the horse, um, one of the basic ways is to, you know, slowly sit with them while they're eating and, and, and giving them space, but getting them acclimated to you being near them, of course, safely. But letting them come to you first, giving, creating an opportunity there's different ways to even help create the opportunity with their natural curiosity is the first step. That is what brings them towards you. Even if in the beginning it's just giving you both their eyes on you, that's enough sometimes. You don't have to do it all in one day. You can build trust through patience and time and build on the yes factor. Someone who has a wonderful program to build the yes factor is if you go to Carolyn Resnick's website, she has a lot of online programs and a lot of clinics. That's a wonderful thing. If you can't get out to a trainer, she has everything online as well in an ongoing student program. A lot of those initial steps just take patience and desire. That's a wonderful way to start your relationship with your horse. Developing an attitude where they look forward to seeing you. And then, of course, socializing them with other horses. You're going to want to make sure that you have adequate fencing. For wild horses coming in, the BLM standards are correct. We use six-foot metal panels, two-inch steel panels. And then later, as the horses relax and they're turned out, we have five-foot fencing. Um, we use barbless wire. Sometimes the top line might be wood or metal, you know, metal pipe, or just a high tensile wire coated in plastic. For our larger areas, some of our pastures have non-climb. If they're smaller pastures, large pastures, we usually just use barbless wire. Fresh water available at all times. Of course, you want to have your feet in place. You want to know your budget. You want to make sure that you're budgeted to be able to provide feed and everything else for the horses that you're adopting for years to come. So you definitely want to figure out your budget before you step into this. Horses are expensive. Shelter, shade your pasture management. If you have pasture, one of the books I highly recommend you read is Paddock Paradise. And you can expand that in different ways. You can adjust it for your own needs, but the concept is brilliant. The horses do need diversity of ground cover. They need a diversity of footing. They need to be able to get into the shade. We have them then walk and get to their mineral blocks with selenium. We want them to then walk to get food. And it's really healthy for them to be moving around instead of standing in a little box all day and waiting for their next meal. Tammy's question is, she would only be able to keep a horse in a stable type situation. So she's thinking a Mustang from a Roundup might not like that. Tammy, <laughs> if you're, you're asking me, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so I would say no. I would, you know, like for Return to Freedom, other people, you know, where, where, if you want to help, Mm -hmm. a nonprofit who is trying to find homes for a Mustang that's already been, you know, through a process where they're handleable and they've mm -hmm. adjusted to a domestic environment, I would recommend that highly. There's a lot of, of sanctuaries and rescues that need to place horses. And I would do that and support them in that way so that the horses that are just coming off the roundup can go to facilities like the sanctuaries or people that have a ranch situation that, you know, would accommodate them because it is, that's a lot of pressure uh, for a horse and it can, it can often result, I can't tell you how many emails we get every week for failed uh, adoptions because of the environment that they're put in. I would suggest you call if you want to help and support another rescue or sanctuary so that they can lighten their load and then they can be available for horses that are just coming off the range. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And um, would you guys be one of those places then that would be, you could I, adopt one and take one? But I, because it's such a long way for them to travel, I feel terrible for them. Where are you? Where you I'm in California, but in Southern California. Yeah. Um, well, that's not too far for the horses from Return to Freedom to travel. But typically, mm -hmm. our, our terms, if we're going to get into our terms and conditions mm -hmm. later, 
Return to Freedom is a little different than other places. We typically don't adopt horses to a like a typical equestrian center where they are kept in very small areas and only have very short turnout times during the day. We adopt to situations where the horse will always be able to be have adequate turnout with other horses and equine relationships and, and that sort of thing. But there are a lot of people that do have horses that have been well trained and schooled and have adapted well to staying in stalls and being turned out for the day and then ridden and things like that. So so for us, probably not so much. I'm sure there are other people that would be happy to take your application. And if you want to email me, I'll I'll be happily introduce you to people. I'll probably just donate money to you guys then since you are trying to save them. That's my main this is mainly what's gotten me. I had a horse when I was younger. Yeah. That it was a I rode English, he was a thoroughbred and of course he yeah. was in his stall all the time, which then I didn't notice as much, but now seeing all this stuff about the wild horses, um Yeah. I, Maybe I'll just have to donate money to you guys because it's so upsetting to see them in those corrals. Yeah, And it chased is. and knowing they've been wild and all the stallions are getting gelded. I, me and my daughter have been talking about it every day and it's so upsetting. So. Yeah. Well, and, and horses are herd animals. Mm-hmm. So, you know, <laughs> we always try to adopt two to four at a time. <laughs> That's like, what I would think, yeah. We had a friend. She had a <laughs> We have someone, a donor of ours, she's a wonderful woman. She has almost 200 acres, and okay. she, we just gave her 18 horses this oh year. Oh, my gosh, but, wow. um, <laughs> but not everybody can do that. Celeste has one of our horses, and mm-hmm. she was able to integrate him when her other horse died, so she now has two horses. Celeste, how, how big a space do you have, five acres? Or? We have, yeah, we have five acres and for the two horses, and we've got the pastures divided up so that I can really do you know, that's a small amount of land to manage a few horses on. And so mm-hmm. making sure that there's spaces I can remove them from so those pastures have time to rest and making sure it's interesting enough so that they have interesting places to wander about and shelter always accessible. And, and some of that just takes a little bit of being creative and, and setting up a situation with what you have and okay. making sure you have the time. People do very creative things to uh, <laughs> enhance their horse's environment in a semi-rural mm-hmm. setting. Yeah. So you don't okay. have to have 20,000 acres to have, um, you know, to adopt a Mustang. And again, mm-hmm. Mustang is not a breed. Sometimes you're going to find a Mustang in an equestrian center that was maybe adopted when he was very, very young and he was raised just like another, any other domesticated horse. So uh-huh. I wouldn't want to discourage you if, you're, mm-hmm. if you really have a heart to do that, but there's many ways that you can adopt a Mustang, and it goes back to the previous slide that says choosing the right horse for you. Exactly. So, yeah. You know, if, if this is the environment you want to look for a Mustang, if it's a Mustang, mm-hmm. that is used to that kind of an environment already, that's mm-hmm. what I would recommend. If it's your first time, do not, I would no. highly not recommend <laughs> you take one of the horses coming off of the current roundup and okay. bring them to an equestrian center and put them in a stall. The yeah. smaller the space, remember it's all about mm-hmm. pressure. That's a lot of pressure for a horse. Because mm-hmm. on one acre, you know, you could have two, two, you know, a couple of horses, depending on the environment and how it is. And people can get pretty creative with an acre. We don't want to forget our burrows, too. <laughs> That's right. A couple of horses, a couple of burrows. But, you know, uh, you know, and it depends where you're living. When we're looking at land, a lot of people ask me, oh, I have 70 acres. How many horses can I put on it? And I, I'm just going to say it depends on how you want to manage your horses. If you're looking at natural management where they're sustained solely from the land, you're going to you really need to look at the area. Every area is different. You're going to graze horses differently in California in the desert versus Oklahoma where you get a lot of rain. So it really depends on where you're you are. Out here where we are, we tend to look at 20, 25 acres per horse. For sustainability and that's if the land is productive if it's severe drought or some of the land is unusable because it's got a lot of scrub on it then you, you can't go acre by acre so you really want to look at how many times during the year do you want to supplement them if you want them to mostly be sustained by the land you really do need to get into some serious pasture management which i highly recommend because it's really good not only for your horse 
but it's great for the environment and all the other creatures that share that environment and the land itself. It's something that as horse owners, I think we all need to be better at doing. And it also translates to the range as well, because some of those, you know, our dry desert habitats are way, are very different than Oklahoma or the East Coast or, you know, Florida. Oh, cost for adoption. Typically, sanctuaries like ours and other rescues, they vary. We do charge more than what the BLM is going to charge for sure. We also ask for credit checks. It's going to be more expensive, most likely adopting from Return to Freedom or a sanctuary because we are very cautious about where the horses go. We want to make sure that they're adopted to someone who has the resources to continue to provide a home uh, for the horses. For us, we can provide haulers, but the adopter pays for the cost of the transportation. Our terms and conditions are on our website, which you'll see our links later in the presentation. The BLM typically charges a lot less and they'll have two-for-one specials and all kinds of things. The good news is it's less expensive on the front end, and that's great because you're going to put your money into training and care. However, the bad news is they often end up being adopted by someone who really shouldn't be adopting a horse. The Bureau of Land Management holds several different types of adoption events. I'm just going to give a quick overview of each different type, but then of course you can find all of this information online kind of tightly packaged so you can figure out what's best for you. I think that the adoption events that we think of as sort of the classic Bureau of Land Management adoption event is their on-site adoption events. In other words, when the horses are gathered from the range, they first are placed into a short-term holding corral. And there's, I don't know, 12 or 14 of them kind of up and down the West Coast. All of those are available on the BLM website and at the particular site that's right there. And so you can go to those actual corrals either when they have an advertised adoption, and all of those are advertised on their website, or you can go to those corrals during their, generally they're open Monday through Friday, 8 to 4 p.m., or you can also make an appointment with staff at that particular site, at that particular short-term holding corral to go and view the horses, and you can adopt right from there. Generally a good idea to have your paperwork done ahead of time, and you can get that paperwork online at their adoption website so that you show up kind of ready to go. But you can quite literally go drive up to a short-term horn corral, choose a horse, and drive away with it if you've done that paperwork ahead of time. So that's the on-site adoption events. The other events are called satellite adoptions, and that's where the BLM advertises that they are going to have horses for adoption at some other horse event, bishop mule days or horse shows, prison training programs that are held at some of the prisons in California and Nevada. And so what happens there is that horses are hauled from a short-term holding facility to whatever this event is, and those again are advertised online. I think all of them for the year are actually placed up there presently. You can go to these events and horses are available there for adoption. And once again, having your paperwork done ahead of time is helpful and that's downloadable online. And the third type is they now do internet adoptions. Their wildhorsesonline.blm website, they call it the online corral. You can adopt a horse from any BLM facility from anywhere. You can be in Georgia and you can go and look at horses, photographs of horses in holding facilities all across the West and you can actually adopt right there online and then you can either arrange to go pick the horse up wherever that holding corral is where the horse happens to be located or you can arrange for the horse to be delivered to another BLM uh, short-term facility or to one of the BLM satellite adoption events that's going on. And that's actually, there's a whole division at the Bureau of Land Management that actually handles just that. That makes it a little bit easier for folks on the East Coast where not a lot of this is going on. They do have some hub facilities sort of partway over to the East Coast that horses can at least get part of the way to you if you're further away. Of course, 
there's a little bit of risk affiliated with just adopting a horse online that you've never met. And so I would just highly advise that you do your good homework and go and even meet that horse and really be ready to do something like that. And there are various options for adopting directly from the Bureau of Land Management. Another thing that the BLM does is they have a trainer incentive program. I think probably most people have heard of the TIP training program. And Mustang Heritage Foundation is a nonprofit that has contracted with the Bureau of Land Management to sort of handle the logistics for tracking that training. So they hire trainers for this program. Horses are paired with these trainers. Once they have been trained to accept a halter and a lead rope and to be led readily about, pick up all four feet and load into a trailer, that is considered a tip trained horse and then they are adoptable at that point. And again, that's through the online adoption site. You can select from the tip trained horses. And then if you are an adopter who's interested in perhaps having that horse trained to a more advanced level, then you go in, you adopt that horse, you can negotiate directly with that tip trainer to put more training on that horse if you would like to. The horses that are generally available for adoption in the short-term holding corrals are the younger horses and horses that have been available for adoption for some amount of time. But then once they have sort of aged out of that process, either they are 10 years of age or older, or they have been offered for adoption three times unsuccessfully, they go into that sort of semi-dreaded sale authority box, which means that they can be sold without limitations. Basically, anyone can come and buy that horse. They don't have to show that they're going to be taking it home forever and ever. Some people think that once a horse has been placed into the sale authority category, that they are unavailable for adoption, and that is absolutely not true. Those sale authority horses are available for adoption. It's good to look at those older guys and those sort of three strikes you're out guys as well, because they are still available if someone will take them. Sale authority is risky, especially to rescue and sanctuary and advocacy organizations because it does put horses into a category where they're not protected. With adoption, you do have a compliance check at the end of the year, and the horse can be returned during that year or taken if you are neglectful. Jane is asking, what do we mean by offered for adoption three times? Jane, if a horse is in the short-term holding corral and has gone to a satellite event or been online and has gone through the process three times and no one has adopted that horse, then they can go ahead and put it into the sale authority category, which means that someone could just come and purchase that horse and not go through the adoption process where there's sort of that one-year system of checks and balances. So one of the biggest issues we just faced recently, if anybody isn't aware, is that in May, BLM changed policy with sale authority. And it used to be that one person could buy four horses. Now it's up to 24, and it can happen daily. So any with no oversight, with pretty much anybody can go, and they can buy for a dollar or $10 the highest bidder, up to 24 horses per day. So that's over 8,500 horses a year per person. So we're hoping that that can be reversed because it really just it kind of opens the back door to easily dispose of the horses that they have in the holding corrals and the long-term pastures. We just have to really oppose that lack of oversight and protection for the horses. So that's the new policy for sale authority. And we're fighting it, not just Return to Freedom, but a whole host of organizations are hoping to to change that. And we've had some good positive conversations with the BLM, and we hope that we can reverse that new policy change. To do that, though, and why we're, we're really hoping to help improve the adoption program, to do that, we are hoping that we can create an adoption community that will no longer... (laughs) <laughs> make it necessary for some of these bad ideas to take hold. If people do have the wherewithal, we're hoping that we can present various creative ideas or ways that you can help, even if you don't have maybe the experience or what have you, but maybe you have the land or the resources. And we're going to get into that in a couple of slides from now. We talked a little bit about trained versus untrained, that you can sort of get through the tip training program and get a horse that's got a little bit of handling on it. The BLM requirements for uh, adopting a horse are pretty good. They're also available online. I'm not going to go through all of them, but they do require that you show up with a 
truck and trailer that is in very good operational order and that you have the proper fencing requirements ready to receive that horse when you get it home. So there are definitely some things that they are going to look at to make sure that you're going to be able to take a either not handled at all or relatively little handled horse home. We got a lot of calls today from people who had trailers to pick up the horses from Modoc, the Devil's Garden or Dove, mm -hmm. and they had ramps and they had slant loads and whatnot. You need to use a stock trailer that's a step up when you're hauling your wild okay. horses and when you're asking us hiring a hauler. So you want to have a step up stock trailer, obviously, unless it's a trained horse. So if it's a if it's a trained horse that's used to loading and being tied in a slant load, that's a different story. But if you're picking up horses, I know there's some people on the call that are planning to pick up horses this weekend, possibly. You're definitely going to want to use a step up stock trailer. The BLM has introduced a new adoption incentive program that is about to roll out. It hasn't rolled out officially just yet, but that is going to be providing adopters with monetary incentive to adopt and it will be a thousand dollars so you'll go and you'll pick up your horse and you'll be given 500 of those dollars i think within about six weeks after getting the horse home and then after you have held a blm horse for a year and all has gone well and checked out then you actually receive title on that horse you don't actually own that horse until one year after adopting and then when you receive title you would receive the remainder of the balance of that thousand dollars. This is a new program. It's a pilot program. It's designed to encourage people to adopt a wild horse as opposed to going out and buying a bred horse from a breeder. And it's designed to help offset the fees of having a horse for that first year. Is it a great idea? <laughs> I'm not totally certain, but it's in the pilot phase. So it, it may be worth testing to sort of help people out to adopt a horse. Well, it's great if it's a good adopter. It's not yes. so great if it's not a good adopter. No adoption is anyway. The Bureau of Land Management has recognized that it is easier to place a horse that has had some level of training into a home than a horse that has had zero handling at all. These are not terribly exciting numbers, but you can see that the number of horses that the Bureau of Land Management is getting at least some level of training on to is rising, and that is going to continue to rise. While the numbers of horses being gathered from the range have been increasing and adoption is not going to keep up with that, the Bureau of Land Management has recognized and has begun implementing better planning for better adoptions, more professional adoptions, more assistance by contractors and folks that are actually very experienced with horses and training and finding homes. So that is a good general trend. These links are all related. It's everything you kind of need to participate in the Devil's Garden adoption or sale. And they have a Facebook page. And there's a wonderful gal who's taking a lot of photos of the horses and doing her best to present the horses so that people can see the horses before they travel to Modoc County and Alturas in Modoc, California. This is what you need to know about what's happening now. The latest plan is that Friday and Saturday from 10 to 3, they're opening up having a sale or event for the wild horses that were just captured that are 10 years old and over. They have them for sale and for adoption. The reason is with priority going to adopters. So if you're buying a horse through sale authority, this is sale authority with oversight. So that's $25 a horse. For the horses being adopted, you can apply to adopt them for $125 a horse. And the reason is, if you adopt the horse 10 years and over and it doesn't work out, you have a year to return the horse to the agency. Whereas with sale authority, you, you get immediate title when you buy the horse for $25. So it's first come, first serve. And when you get there, you can peruse the corrals and choose either recently gelded stallions or mares. They were making stallions available if people had selected them and sent in with their application that they wanted this particular horse as a stallion, then they would not have gelded him. But I think that may have passed. I think they were having them all completed today. Horses will be ready. They would have had their vaccinations, Coggins and gelding. They've been wormed by the time of the event. 
mayors that already have had foals that are on the ground, uh, they're being transported along with the younger horses to the Bureau of Land Management's Litchfield facility. They're going to go through the adoption program sometime in December. Let's talk about the pigeon fever outbreak. So last week, we obviously there was, uh, I think, six or seven horses were euthanized because they had what's called pigeon fever. Pigeon fever is also known as dryland. It's a bacteria. It's usually found in the ground. Most of us who have ranches are used to this. It's livestock uh, carry it. We are upset because typically pigeon fever doesn't usually become an issue that would require euthanizing a horse. We've had pigeon fever on this ranch many times. It's not a strep virus like strangles but it, it is a bacteria and it's in the ground. And when it's dry, it tends to flourish. Typically, the horse is under stress and if their immune system's down, they're gonna be a little more vulnerable, usually younger horses or old horses. Typically, it'll move through the herd and it can look worse than it is in that there's abscesses and pussy drainage and things like that. It gets transmitted by people walking in it and walking to another area or flies etc. And you usually quarantine the animal, try to keep your shoes, boots clean when you go from that area to another, not touch another horse's drainage or anything coming out of their nose, and then go touch another horse. So you use pretty strict, at least here at the sanctuary when we've had it, we've been very strict about the hygiene around it and not transferring it. But typically it runs through the, ho the herd or the band or the group of horses and then it's done. And hopefully a good freeze will kill it. We usually scrape our ground where the horses were. If it's a small enough area, we also spray it down with a hose with a Clorox as well after we scrape it. Clorox, like the railings in the, in the area, if it's in a horse trailer, it's not really that big of a deal. You attach the little Clorox, you know, the little sprayer to your hose and you can thoroughly spray down the inside of your trailer anywhere where the horse was if you're transporting a horse that has uh, pigeon fever. They're not going to be spreading it until there's nasal drainage or drainage coming out of abscesses and, and that sort of thing. Celeste, do you want to say anything else about this? Pigeon fever is it's not uncommon, and it's not uncommon up in the area where the outbreak is happening right now. It has a very low mortality rate, 0.6% mortality rate. It generally runs its course. Very rarely are there complications. So we are quite alarmed that the response by Forest Service would be to euthanize animals that were showing symptoms. We are digging into that to find out a little bit more. We don't really have a lot more information to share about this particular instance and why they have decided to euthanize animals because of it. We did want to let people know that it is common and it is not that big a deal, but you definitely want to know about it because certainly if you were bringing horses in that had been exposed to pigeon fever, you wouldn't want to be prepared for that, bringing them to a new site. But it is not terribly dreadful to prepare for that. If you are adopting a horse this weekend from Devil's Garden and you are going to take that horse to your facility, it's easy to clean the trailer. If they're not draining and they have no symptoms, there's probably nothing to clean up. If, but I would keep the horses Correct. quarantined for at least a month where they're not touching noses with your other horses. If you're only adopting one horse, don't isolate the horse to where they can't see other horses. That would just add stress. What you want to do is just keep these horses as de-stressed as possible. Good food, good water, low stress, a nice environment. And, and as they relax, they should feel more comfortable. Just keeping their immune system happy is the best thing you can do. We have put in a request to the Forest Service asking them to consider postponing the event this weekend. We strongly suggest it. We have a couple of vets that are actually agreeing with us on this. So we're hoping that we can have it postponed so that the entire herd that they've just gathered, who are completely stressed out, can have a respite and adequate time to decompress before they're sorted and sorted again and where they can wait and see if there's any more eruptions. The only reason that I can think of that would make sense that they would have euthanized horses is if they were aware of any internal abscesses or something like that that would really create a medical issue for a horse, but I don't know how they would know that. We're not really happy about it, but again, we don't know the details on why they made that determination because if they do that 
to seven, that means any horse that has an abscess, you know, <laughs> could just be euthanized. And this is really a solvable issue. It, it happens on ranches often. Or Someone is asking, do they develop antibodies from pigeon fever? And yes, they do. There have been some instances of repeat infections, but generally they are primed and ready for next time around and don't get it again. Yeah, typically they don't. We've had a sanctuary for 20 years, and we only had one horse, a young filly, died of complications. She had an internal abscess in her intestine, and that was the only time. She was very young. So, again, it can affect, you know, young foals more than it can affect mature horses. And then if it does affect um, the horses, it runs through the herd, and then they usually are stronger. Our experience is that they've been more immune to that sort of thing. Adopting from return to freedom. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, we really appreciate it <laughs> when we find <laughs> wonderful homes for the horses that we do have for adoption here. And we have, especially last year, we, were, we participated in a 900 horse rescue project. We were supporting a fleet of angels. Pretty much everybody participated in that rescue. Pretty much everybody nationally helped in some way with that great effort. In the end, we ended up with about 116 horses from the Gila herd. They're Spanish colonial. They came originally from, I think, the Painted Cave area in Arizona. They were known as the Painted Cave horses. And then they were adopted by the sanctuary, um, I think, in 2003, where they reproduced to an unmanageable number. I mean, all, and then including all the horses at this sanctuary just kept reproducing. The Gila herd was kept in a separate area. Uh, they're mainly Duns and Grolias. We had a sponsor for them for the first year or so, and we were able to lease about 1,800 acres in Northern California, and we just relocated them to a 1,000-acre pasture with wonderful water, et cetera. But, you know, we would like to find homes for a lot of them. And we, at the time, I think Celeste inoculated about 60 mares with the fertility control, gelded almost 50 stallions. We've kept a small number of colts because we were having their DNA done and their uh, phenotyping. Phenotyping was done by Dr. Sponenberg. He made wonderful notes. And then Dr. Gus Cothran did the DNA. They're excited because they have a large closed group that they can compare the notes on the phenotyping with the results from the DNA. But until we had all that and had the horses documented and could understand, really wrap our arms around the relationships of the horses within the herd and all of that, the only horses that we moved to Lompoc for adoption were the colts that were five years old and under that were gelded. So we still have a number of them. We've adopted about 11, and we have still about 12 of the younger horses, and they're super soft. So I wanted to talk a little bit about when you adopt from Return to Freedom, and I'm guessing from a couple of other sanctuaries as well. Some of the horses are going to be already trained and halter broke, et cetera. Some, like these horses, are not. We do not have the financial support to train this, you know, a large number of horses every year. It's just, it's very expensive because training takes time. <laughs> Yet these horses are what I call soft in that they're ready to go to school. They're happy. They're comfortable. They're used to us milling around them. They'll come up for a scratch or, or a sniff, some more than others but they're ready for people that either ha that have the right home and environment for them and can train them, bring them from this stage to becoming a safe handled horse or are working with a trainer who can. And they're really nice horses. So we have a number of these guys and a couple of other horses that have been through various rescues or coming from herds that we have here that are available for adoption. The Gila horses are various shades of dun. Some have some grulia, and they're not very tall. They're about 14 hands to 14 two. You can go online and to our link on our terms and conditions. It's under our take action section on our website under and then under adopt. And we have links to our terms and conditions and then our adoption application. And you can fill that out and email it to equine at return to freedom .org. And we'll review it. We do site checks and we do ask for a generous donation to help cover our expenses with these horses. The, with the healer herd, there isn't a lot of training, obviously. There's not a lot of those expenses. So we prefer to have that be a lower adoption fee so that the right person can put 
uh, the money into training and proper care for these horses. But they won't be free. We just want to make sure that there is appreciation for the value of the horses and the, and the supporters of Return to Freedom, the donors, what they've put into making the sanctuary available to all these horses. We prefer that people take bonded horses together. What we've done recently, and actually always, is people who only can take one horse. We've been lucky in that they've been able to bring their other horses here and introduce the horses. We recently adopted Storm to someone in Los Angeles. She came up a few weekends and brought her two horses each time, and they'd spend the weekend. I think she came up for three different weekends, and she hiked with the horses and got them to know each other, turned them out, and then the third weekend she took a storm home with them, and they're doing really well. But that's what we like to do. We like to make sure we're really trying to do this for the horses. At the same time, if it doesn't work for the adopter, it's not going to work for the horses. So we try to work with people, but the first step is filling out the application, seeing if we have a horse that is right for you, whether it be size, the level of handling that it has had already. And if we don't have a horse that's um, right for you, we have a lot of friends that might. When you adopt a horse from a sanctuary or a rescue, you're actually helping us save more lives. This Gila Gelding is just one of my favorite horses in the Gila herd. He's exceptionally friendly and inquisitive and confident, but not in an obnoxious way. He's just ready to be somebody's partner. He's wonderful. The Gila horses are soft. These are all horses that were gelded last year. They're all between four and five years old. And they're soft in that they're curious. Uh, they haven't been handled but they're ready to start their education and to um, have a relationship with a very special human being. I'm going to briefly mention our conservator program. This developed organically. We had a few donors that had land. They made it available to Return to Freedom as a satellite. That was a 2,000-acre satellite in San Luis Obispo in 2015. It was a significant step forward for our work, but also for the horses, for them to be able to have that kind of habitat where there's a lot of rock and sand, their hooves are perfect, there's springs all over. They're really living in a more natural way, and this is exactly what we wanted for the sanctuary. More recently, another couple have bought a 1,000 acres, and they're doing the same thing. This inspired us to create the conservatory program. Locally, the horses in these two spots are still managed, and the oversight still lands on Return to Freedom. But we want to expand this program nationally to people who may have their own ranches and their own staff. And we would just make our team available to help you train your staff and your team so that you can have a successful uh, program on your property. We're also working on hopefully introducing some legislation that would help landowners who want to make their land available to work with a nonprofit. If you are one of these people and you would like to participate in the conservator program, feel free to email me, wildhorses at returntofreedom.org. I'd be happy to have that conversation. Obviously, we can't provide oversight for horses all over the place. I think we're pretty stretched, but what we would like to do is you know, work with people who want to hopefully provide a, a home for a number of horses and we can help, you know, set you up for success. When you don't have a horse that's handleable, you still have to address any medical needs that might come up, worming, vaccinations, and mainly hoof care. And we, for that, we have, because we manage hundreds of horses, obviously we have to have a handling chute. So we do have a hydraulic squeeze chute. It's padded. It does have a table so we can squeeze them and safely put them on their sides and trim their feet and then put them back down. We can anesthetize a horse and put, pull them out the side so that we can geld them safely. We've never had any serious injuries ever. I think that's because we really take the time to on days that we're using the chute and we don't overtire our staff on those days. We have to make sure that we really pace ourselves because the adrenaline can get high, the horses are scared, so we really try to do this in a calm way. Horses get habituated to it when they learn that they don't die over time if they've been run through the chute a few times. They never like it, but at least they, they know where to go. So those are conversations we can have if any of you are interested in being a conservator on your property. 
feel free to email me at wildhorses at return to freedom.org so we can start to see what level of interest we have. We just want to shout out to the Science and Conservation Center in Billings, Montana, and the late Jay Kirkpatrick, who was my mentor and friend, trained Celeste Carlisle, our biologist, to safely implement the PZP fertility control program, which we've used here for, gosh, 18 years, something like that, and to collect data. We've had a 91% success rate here at the sanctuary, and we've also utilized gelding horses, but we always try to do the least invasive thing that we can do while maintaining natural behavior. We did some vasectomies on some lead stallions, and that worked well. They maintain behavior, but they are not reproducing. All in all, our favorite tool is the PZP vaccine because it does allow for conservation if you want to. It also allows for uh, the more, more natural behaviors and allows the stallions to do their job. We, we definitely think the stallions deserve a fair shake. They, they, they have it rough in the wild and they have it rough when they're captured. So our hearts go always go out to the stallions. Everybody wants mares and foals, so we're hoping that um, any of you that are interested in adopting stallions that were just recently gelded from the Roundup, let us know, and, and I'm happy to talk to you about that. I think stallions are greatly misunderstood. We have a pasture of 18 stallions that are all together, and these guys were rounded up in 2010. Some of them have been reintegrated back with their mares after they've been vasectomized, but all in all, these guys, I mean, you can walk all around them and, and all of that. I mean, it's not that they're all interested in us or touchable, but they've settled in really well. We don't have any issues. It's all about good feed, good water, shade, good friends, safe fencing, and having a chute that where you can handle them safely if you need to until they're trained, if they're going to be trained. Somebody asked if we had burrows. 42 burrows, and we want more. We love the burrows. They're really lovely, <laughs> and they're very, every, everyone loves the burrows. Um, our conservators love the burrows. They want more burrows. Yes, we do have burrows. They're all gelded, so we're not using the PZP on the burrows, but you can. Yes, Pam, the same rules do, do apply to adopt a burrow, as far as I know. Can they live in a stable situation? Pam, are you talking about the burrows? The burrows, oh yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, burrows are incredibly adaptable, just like the horses are. All equines are so adaptable. It's their best, it's their survival, it's their best secret weapon, you know. Our burrows live in the oak forest, and then they live on the 2,000 acre place, and then we have a couple of burrows that just didn't want to hang out there, like Jasper and, of course, Buckwheat Braze when he sees me, and they like a lot more attention. So it really, again, depends on personalities, just like horses. They're very clever. Jasper can open gates and let other horses loose. He did so the other day. We had three wild horses <laughs> running around the driveway. <laughs> Luckily, our whole area is fenced, so they really can't get anywhere, but they're definitely intelligent. Yeah, he just got the chain in his mouth and kind of, you know, chews on it and plays around till he got the clip open somehow. But he's a master at that. So it really does depend. But the burrows are very opinionated, as you know, and they can be stubborn, but they can be extremely social and like, you know, endearing and like terminally cute, like very, very cute. So I, mm -hmm. we just can't get enough of the burrow love and neither can our guests or our supporters or our staff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thanks for asking. But burrows don't need a lot of the heavy feeds. Um, so I just think, you know, think in terms of they're lower maintenance. They don't need a lot of alfalfa. We have one older burrow that just needs a little special feeds because he just, he's older and it was hard keeping the weight on. And he seems to be doing okay with it. Uh, but typically we don't throw alfalfa to the burrows in, unless they're mixed in with horses and they might get the alfalfa mix. Hey, uh, they don't need as much food. Tammy is asking, she's saying it's a lot to think about. She appreciates our time. Is it best to donate online or do you pay a fee? Is it better to send a check? So one of the wonderful programs we have, and we just hope everyone will think about it, especially this holiday season, is sponsoring a horse at the sanctuary. Having horses is very expensive, uh, and if you can't if you can't make huge donations, um, there's a lot you can do. But if you go to our sponsor a horse page on the website, 
there's different levels of sponsoring and obviously for a gift for someone or uh, if a group of people go to work together to sponsor a horse or a herd but basically it goes from $25, $50 a month up to $250 a month. Yeah, so if you donate for dental and hoof care, $25 can be attributed to that. Um, you can make a note with your donation to say what it would, you would like it to go for, or it could be a general donation that we would apply to our greatest need. We spend about half a million dollars a year in feed and grazing leases. That is a lot. <laughs> and then our vet bills are between twenty-five and forty-five thousand dollars a year. We have over five hundred wild horses and forty-two burrows that we um, manage. So every donation, no matter how large or how small, makes a difference. It has a direct impact. Believe me, we're counting them every day, so we appreciate it. Um, we're here to support our supporters, and we so appreciate you supporting the work that we do and the horses. Oh, thank you, Tammy, for looking at sponsoring. And for gifts, too, we're going to have our next mailer will go out. It will have, we have certificates that you can give people if you're sponsoring in their name and that kind of thing. Depending on where you live, if you have a group of people and you want to have a fundraiser in your home, we can send you a party in a box with a lot of information by people. You can help. If you're local, you can volunteer. You can also volunteer um, even if you live in another area through advocacy work and fundraising and uh, raising awareness, introducing other people to return to freedom so we could build our mailing list. That's, a, that's huge, huge. And we do have tours. We just stopped our tours, but we, we have photo safaris almost all year long, uh, depending on the weather. Those are pricier because that is our high dollar item. And it was started out because it was geared towards photographers. But we do have safa photo safaris and they're just really exciting and really fun. And we have a wonderful picnic lunch or evening, kind of late, early evening, late afternoon picnic snack that we create. Thank you, Kathy. She's saying the photo safari is well worth the price. Yeah, we think really amazing experience. And we prefer to take people to the San Luis Obispo property where it really feels more natural. But our facility in Lompoc is where we have spirit the muse for the DreamWorks movie, Spirit Stalling and the Cimarron, and a lot of various horses that have been ambassadors for a long time. We have more, this is a more management intensive on the 300 acre facility in Lompoc. The tours will start up again here in the first Saturday in May, and they go through the end of August. But the photo safaris in San Luis Obispo are pretty much all year. Just look at our website for dates. I think our last one for this year is next this coming Saturday um, but usually if we have four people or more we will book one and um, so if you have four people that will do it then we will make that happen thank you for appreciating our work <laughs> thank you I'm glad it was informative thank you so much again from every one of us from our board of directors our volunteers and our staff and most of all from the horses